Hello and welcome to my Bevy Game Jam Part 1. On August 20th, 2021, at 4am, I got an email reminding me that the Bevy Game Jam 2 had started. I considered rolling out of bed and finding out what the theme was so I could start thinking about it. Instead, I went back to sleep and promptly forgot about the whole thing. Until the next day. And, you know, turns out to be a good idea, because when I returned to my computer and was looking through the Discord channel, I discovered that the theme hadn't been announced for like 25 minutes after, because Cart had just apparently vanished and was the only person that had knew what the theme was. There's tons of jokes and memes about what the theme could be, and all these people claiming to have finished their game because clearly the theme was disappearing or nothing, those kinds of things. After I realized that there was no point scrolling through all the memes and that the announcement could be easily found in the announcements channel, go figure, I wasted no time and jumped over to the channel to find out what the theme had been. It was combined. I immediately knew what game I wanted to make. I'd had this idea rattling around in the back of my mind for years. And then recently it had re-emerged, so much so to the point that literally the other week before the Bevy Game Jam started, I decided that I might take the concept of the game and then adapt the theme to match it. And this was a matching game of where you combine elements, such like Doodle God and Little Alchemist. Back when I was a kid, I spent many hours playing Doodle God and Doodle Devil, trying to finish those games and unlock all the elements. And many years later, I found Little Alchemy, which was more or less the same thing, but without all the story and God applications to it. And way, way more elements to unlock. At the beginning of this year, I, or maybe sometime in 2021, I found out that there was a Little Alchemy 2. So I started playing it. It was great. I loved how in the beginning, just about any combination would result in something, as long as it was a reasonable thing to expect to combine. And this remained mostly true into the late game, though there was some combinations that I felt were really obviously missed. And obviously as the complexity grew, it became harder and harder to come up with reasonable assumptions on what two elements might combine into. Though this got me thinking, because I had noticed that certain combinations of recipes always resulted in something predictable, such as combining anything that flew with if any of the metals that you could unlock would give you an aeroplane. As a programmer, I obviously started to wonder how this had been implemented. The first and most obvious was that each recipe had been hard-coded with this item plus this item equals some other item. Then I thought of a better way of doing this, and it's probably the most likely that Little Alchemy actually uses, is to use some kind of flag system and have recipes specified that these flag combinations would result in these other recipes. So this would allow things like birds to be specified with flying, and the metals to be given, the metallic trait, and this would result in combining flying and metallic giving you aeroplane. With this idea in mind, as I continued to play the game, I noticed some pitfalls though. Not all of the birds would result in this combination, even though they were flying birds. Obviously, you know, I don't expect penguin and metal to turn into an aeroplane, but I believe vulture and metal also had this problem. So I figured that they must be assigning the tags manually, so not everything gets these tags assigned. This obviously re is required to some extent because of the necessity of the complexity of the game. You couldn't automatically determine without some very complex AI what tags would need to be assigned to the item. Though I did think that what if you could have, say, a bird tag that automatically assigned corresponding tags, such as flying and egg laying, to whatever you gave the bird tag. Then using this, you could also have anti-tags, such as non-flying, which would prevent the flying tag from being applied, and then allow certain tags to be propagated down the system, such as all things made from stone may acquire the stone trait. Or, for example, if you combine something with bird, the result is also given bird, whereas it combining with the sub-trait such as flying would not have this property transferred down. My plan for my game in the jam is to make an element combination game that uses self-propagating rules to generate the flags for the elements. This is used in the recipes. This would mean that you simply flag a bird as such, and it would automatically get all of the properties associated with being a bird. This would then allow for recipes to be created where I could simply say that all birds are all flying, and this would get combinations of elements. Doing it this way would also allow to make the game extremely extendable, since as long as you use the same flags, you could unintentionally create new chains of recipes to get to certain elements. But this also means that you don't need to use exactly the same flags because if you are classifying something requiring flying and someone else adds the flag birds that automatically inherits flying, then without you having to create recipes, the birds trait will automatically mean that their combinations work with your recipes. That's enough about the game. Let's move on to, onto the making and what I achieved in the first few days of the jam. As I mentioned before, I basically was busy and skipped through the entire first day of the jam. But 
was ready to go on the second day. The first thing I did was use Cart's Bevy project template, linked in the description if you would like to use it. There is still time in the jam, hopefully, when I get this video up. I decided to call my game Voidonomicon because I wanted to start with the only that one element and make all the other elements from the element void. And then I was wrapping the whole thing in a kind of, kind of conceptual book that you were learning the recipes for the rest of the universe, hence playing on Nomicon or the Necronomicon extending of like book of. While the game was building its dependencies for the first time, I went and got myself a cup of tea. I tried to include the op-level 3 package performance that I mentioned in my part 1 version of Bevy, but this seemed to just cause the whole thing to not compile. It had a linking error for some reason. I originally thought it was something to do with the template and me renaming things arbitrarily inside the template, but even all the renaming was removed and reverted and it still failed to link. When I finally worked out that it was the Opt Level 3 doing it, I went on to try to capture the game. It wasn't showing up in OBS, so I decided to include a preset window size because I thought maybe OBS was requesting this information and Bevy was returning 0, 0. Hence, there is a known bug that I haven't actually reported that if you minimize your Bevy game, it will crash because it tries to divide by 0. This didn't end up changing anything, but it is convenient to know that the game will launch in the same resolution on all computers because this allows me to use these values for generating numbers. Uh, such as where to spawn the elements on the screen. After finally working out how to make OBS capture the game window, I put it in position and started off making the Bevy logo splash screen disappear after 1.25 seconds. This will become relevant in part two of the video, but I don't want to spoil any of the story or lore, so stay tuned. During this process, I discovered the new pre-release build of Rust Analyzer now has the bug that the old version had, where it cannot derive and unwrap the macros of derives. This results in my project being filled with non-existing errors and you will see all throughout my files them saying that they have an error. This doesn't actually show up at compile time. It is purely only visible in the editor. With this done, I moved on to making the UI. This is simply a hash map containing UI names as the key and the handle to the respective image. It is loaded from a file in the assets folder so that the game doesn't need to be recompiled if I want to change UI elements. This doesn't get used in this video, but will be hopefully expanded on the next video when I add things like tooltips that will need access to UI elements. Then I got into some of the foundations needed, such as items and its respective components. The item ID, which is a, a wrapper around a U64 hash of its name, I use this to be able to quickly share and copy names of the item IDs around so that I don't have to have large components holding the name and all the information. This is then used as in the items resource to be able to look up the name and icon later on to reacquire this information for display purposes. Otherwise, it is simply a hash, and this is much faster and efficient than storing the name because compares can be done in a single operation. I made the item frame and icon configurable in a file as well, so that again, without needing to rebuild the program, I can adjust sizes, such as if you wanted your UI to be larger, you could just adjust the size of this in the file. I added the ability to load items from a file. At the moment, this is only consists of the name and path to the icon, but in the future, it will contain tags for the items as well when I implement that into the game. A quick system that allows me to spawn a test item and voila. I then added the Bevy Editor Please plugin to the project to allow me to change and tweak settings without needing to rebuild the game. You'll see a consistent theme with this. Because of Rust's slow compile times, it is very important early on to speed up development to make as much of your game optimized away into configuration files so that when you rebuild the game, you don't need to wait for your game to rebuild in order to tweak small things such as UI. Bevy Editor Please is a great way of doing this at the moment with Bevy not having an officially supported editor. I also changed from to using sprites for the items in the world instead of UI elements. This is so that I can basically place them freely in the world without the UI system trying to align them and apply the flex box to them. I also added a system that with a new item spawned, it moved to the top by increasing its Z level to 0.01 above what the previous item spawned was. This is used to prevent Z fighting in the sprites and later on to click detection to determine which sprite is on top. This is also used to increment the layer when the item is moved. I then remembered to include Bevy's diagnostics. Since I'm using the Bevy editor, please, it comes by default with ability to see these diagnostics. They just need to be included separately. And the final thing I did for this day was add some basic click detection for the items. By copying the mouse to screen location logic in the Bevy cheat book, which will be linked below, 
then a basic box collision that takes in a mouse position and the box size and center point will then return whether the mouse uh, was whether the box was hit or not then i order that by the z level and then pick the top the top one and set it as the selection on mouse down and then unselect it on mouse up this concludes everything that was done on the first day the second day started off with me writing up basically the script for what i'd done the day before let's see what i get done now well as, as i kind of uh, expected i didn't get very much done today mostly from writing the script put me in not necessarily the best mood for to continuing the game development summarizing six hours of programming over the course of an hour doesn't really put you in the mood to do another six hours of programming <laughs> So all I'd managed to get done today was add two more functions to my physics. One that detects box over box collisions so that I can tell when an element is dropped. And then another system that does the same but returns the amount that these boxes overlapped by. This allows me to determine when you drop an element which other element it is considered to have collided the best with. Then made it possible to pick up the items and move them around. Obviously this had the small error of needing to invert the Y direction because when I moved the mouse up the element went down and when I moved, uh, moved the mouse down the element went up but that was simply invert the Y direction. I then did some basic refactoring of the click detection from yesterday to use def events instead of directly setting the resource itself. This is later used to raise and lower the elements as well because I emit a, an event that says pick this item up, which will allow me to set the item's height and set its selection in two separate systems. That's all the programming that I really got done for the day, but I did spend some time writing down ideas for combinations of elements and what the story I would like for this game, which at this point is quite meta. So that you won't see because it's all written in a physical textbook in the real world. But anyway, on to the, th the third day of programming or developing the game, fourth day of the gem. The first thing was to test my physics code by making the item detection when they are dropped onto another item and by how much. Then I fixed a bug where the system was not relayering the items properly. This was simply because I had changed the system of how I spawned items and was no longer setting the... Instead of detecting that the item had been spawned that turn by looking for added of the specific item ID, I was emitting an event to say that the item had been spawned. I had simply forgotten to actually emit that event. This is simply fixed. But this then required the system to be moved into post update so that the element had actually had a chance to spawn because it wasn't updating the element because it was trying to update before the system had had a chance to spawn the transform in. I simply moved the system to post update and this was all fixed. I then spent a while adding tags and then making them serialized and deserialized from strings while being stored and passed around as U64 values. I'm simply using a lazy static hash map, which when you create a new string, will save that name with the corresponding hashed value. And then you can look up that value later for serialization purposes or display purposes. I also added a bunch of tests. This is made even funnier by the fact that I don't actually use these tags for any point in the rest of this video, but hopefully they will be a vital part in the future of this game. I then did some bug fixing to make sure that the icons actually appeared above their frame because for some reason, the bevy logo was rendering correctly, being directly layered on top of the frame, but the test item that I was using was not when it was just rendering another sprite. I then move on to recipes. This took a lot of iterations in my head to try and get right because of the complexity of trying to come up with the space and how I will add the complexity of recipe combinations when it comes to tags. At least in this point in the development, what I ended up with is a hash map of hash maps containing a vector of results. This is basically using the first hash map as the first item in the recipe and the second hash map as the second. And then the resulting vector of item IDs is the resulting items. It also contains next to the vector a U16, which is the priority. Hopefully this doesn't all consume too much memory and need to be refactored away immediately once the recipes get beyond a certain scope. But the intention for this working is whenever you add a recipe, it looks up in the first hash map, the first part of the recipe, then gets the second part and then compares the priority of the recipe you're adding to the current recipe there. If the priorities are the same, it will add the result of the recipe you're trying to add into that vector so that you can have recipes that result in multiple outputs. This is then, but if the recipe's priority is lower, then it will actually overwrite the recipe with the new one since I am considering a priority zero recipe as you saying this recipe needs to be hard coded. And then if the recipe priority is higher, it will be ignored. This will allow me to make automatically generated recipes, such as, again, the example of the birds and flying, to be at a higher priority, the more 
down the tree they fall in terms of like auto generation. This will mean that if you hard code a recipe, it will never be overwritten by a recipe that's automatically generated. Because of its complexity, I wrote some tests to make sure that the recipes were actually returning the recipe result I was expecting. And if I do refactor this in the future, that the recipes continue to work. The way the recipe system works at the moment is that there is the recipes resource that you can then call combine on and will tell you what recipe result it got. I then went on to make sure that the recipes could be passed from strings. This will allow me to make recipes from files, which again, will mean not really needing to recompile, but also adds to the modability of it by simply allowing you to add to the recipes directory your own file containing all the recipes that you want the game to make. This also means that the game won't break if you add recipes for items that don't exist because they will have unique IDs that will just never be accessible inside the hash map unless the item is added to the game in a separate file. At the moment, the way you add a recipe to the game is on a single line in your file, you write the first item with spaces being replaced with underscores. I remove white space in order to prevent conflicts when I'm passing numbers. I then separate with a plus sign, followed by the second item in the recipe, then an equal sign, and the final item that will be resulting from that recipe. You can then optionally add a semicolon at the end, followed by the priority of that recipe. This will mean, again, if you add a modded recipe, you could say, put it at like priority three. So if someone else adds a recipe, theirs can override yours. If say, you, cause you couldn't come up with anything better. And you thought if someone else has a better recipe, they should take precedent over yours. I added some tests for this as well. I then made the recipes resource automatically load all the recipes in the recipes folder when the game starts, as long as the file that's in their folder ends with a.vr, which is short for void recipes. Items does exactly the same thing, but using the file extension vi. At the moment, if you would like to declare items in the game, you do the same as the recipes, except on each line you put name, colon, and then what the name is in quotes. Then you go into a new line and you put the icon colon and then in quotes the path to the icon relative to the assets path. And this will use Batboo's asset loader in order to load that file and will assign the handle respectively. You then put in between curly braces next in all lowercase. This is then used to indicate to the code that following that will be the next item as opposed to continuing data for the current item. I've also added at this point the tags ability, which is basically the word tags with the colon, then square brace, and then a declaration of strings between quotes, separated by commas, and then close the square brace. This will allow, at the current state of the game, for you to add your own items if you wanted to currently experiment with the game by downloading it from the GitHub. And finally, for this video, and to reach what I would call the minimum viable product, as in a game that I could actually post as being a game, I added a system that would check when an item is dropped and if it hit anything. Then passes the most overlapped and checks what combinations of items that could be, be created from that item and its overlap. It then will spawn the results of the combination nearby and remove the items that were combined. At this point, I consider the game at least playable to a point of like, you could make some really fun recipes at, and you know, have a little bit of fun with your friends. And that brings us to the end of the video. In the next video, I intend to add say basic tool tips and like a field so you can see a name and maybe descriptions for items for storytelling purposes and a basic story that will build on like uh, some meta humor I have planned out for the game. And a saving system, obviously, so that your game progress is not lost every time you restart. Then I'm going to work on the dynamic recipe system. So please like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll hopefully see you in part two of my Bevy Game Jam game.